In the case of pleiotropy, what happens is that we actually are talking about multiple genes. So instead of talking about, um, about uh, a trait as if it is the result of a single pair of genes on your chromosome, um, pleiotropy is the idea that some traits are actually the result of multiple genes that are working together. So um, when one gene has multiple effects on the phenotype, oh, wait, I might be thinking about epistasis. Yeah, okay, I was thinking about epistasis. All right, so <laughs> the pleiotropy is the idea that one gene actually has effect on multiple, uh, multiple endpoints. Um, so a good example is that, um, you know, uh, a lot of like, a lot of the time if you, uh, uh, or there are definitely certain genes, for example, in, in humans that can have um, multiple, multiple effects, uh, you know, uh, dark, dark hair can sometimes come with, uh, you know, with more pigment in the eyes or more pigment in, uh, in the skin a little bit. You know, sometimes there's uh, there's some overlapping effects where you can get uh, you can get um, a general you know darker features by if you carry a dark a, cer a certain type of the darker gene. Um, I don't know if I like that example. Maybe I'll cut that. Okay. Put a little. Pleiotropy is an example. Sometimes I'll make myself a little note. Okay, so pleiotropy is when one gene has multiple effects on the phenotype of individuals. So I like these examples that I've got right here, which is um, Mendel, for example, when he was counting up his pea plants, occasionally he would have red flowers. And whenever he had the red flowers, he would also note a vase of his flowers. And uh, he kind of just ignored it at the time because he didn't know a way to explain it or it didn't fit the models he was working on. But um, the, uh, the I, the result was that they realized that, that uh, looking back now, we realized that if you had, say, a gene here that could be, you know, this is the red gene, then that red gene might have effects on the flower and the leaves. So flower color and leaf color. color. it should just be leaf okay leaf color so this single gene gene number one here is affecting more than one trait and um, and this happens also in human beings so for example in albino individuals or individuals living with alb albinism um, full uh, the true albinism can have a an effect where the gene combination prevents pigment from forming in the skin and hair and also can cause modification of the eye nerve. So a single gene pair uh, has all has effects on three different outcomes: hair, skin, and eye nerve uh, construction. And so the result is often a, a, a is a, a condition of crossed eyes, sometimes blindness or um, or some uh, some eye uh, eye damage. So the eyes will actually de uh, will not uh, not develop in this in the same way because of that gene combination. And uh, yeah, there's a you know if you want we can uh, we can do a quick little albinism check here uh, albinism, and uh, you can see some examples here of different individuals born with albinism. Um, these are these are ones who, they sometimes can have an ocular uh, repair, uh, their, uh, the eye nerve repaired, but occasionally um, we can see some crossing. It's usually one, you know, even the loss of eye color in the iris, uh, resulting in that red, uh, that distinctive red uh, iris as well. This is the one I was looking so here is a, a the oculocutaneous albinism. Uh, you can see in this uh, this child here, uh, where he uh, you can see the eye uh, crossing there, or the uh, the eyes uh, not crossed. Uh, you can see also with this child here. 
So that sometimes can be repaired in childhood with, uh, with surgery, but uh, sometimes those surgeries are not effective either. So let's do a little example uh, question here. So the dominant red allele for the snapdragons can also cause red veins in the leaves of the flower. Describe the possible phenotype ratios um, for the cross of two pink snapdragons that, that emphasizes both the color, the flower color, and the leaf color. So in this case, what we might be looking at would be, you know, uh, a question we've already done before. We're going to cross our two pink, our two pink uh, snapdragons, and we're going to say, Oh yeah, this is uh, this is easy, John. We did this already, and that's true. We did it once before, but now with this extra information, we're going to realize something special about some of these flowers over the others. So, for example, if this is our red gene, then we see that red gene in all three of these flowers. So our genotype ratio was something that looks like this, you know, one to two to one. Our phenotypes are red, pink, and white flowers. But for our leaves, we have three red veined leaves and one normal leaf. So we've got sort of, we've layered on a new, a new, a whole new layer of exciting information there. Um, that is very exciting. There's a, a lot of screaming outside my room right now, but I don't know. I think they're playing, <laughs> but I'm like, Okay, so uh, so this is the idea of a uh, of, plyo, of pleiotropy. So uh, it can be very difficult. I don't know. Every year I do pleiotropy, and I find that students uh, struggle with it a little bit. Um, it's tricky to wrap your mind around. We like to think about one pair of alleles having one effect, but in fact, this is actually more the norm. Is that most genes have more than one effect? Uh, even something like um, like genes that control, uh, you know, testosterone output, they can have an effect on hair loss, for example. So baldness is emphasized by testosterone. So high levels of testosterone plus ba plus balding genes, and you can uh, you can you might have balding. But if you don't have that extra, if you don't have though that extra testosterone, then you can carry balding genes with having no effect. So that uh, that. And of course, producing testosterone also has lots of other effects, like uh, so you know, uh, there's a whole bunch of other things we can think about. I'm going to contrast that with epistasis, sort of, sort of contrasting. Um, so, epistasis is when a trait has new phenotypes that depend on the alleles of two different genes. So, in our previous example, um, what we really should have is, uh, or we actually have this sort of drawn out. This gene is a, this trait here is an epistasis trait. So this is an epistatic trait. Epistatic trait uh, depends on more than one gene. So we can see that this that these three genes coming together one two three that cr that creates whatever this p two trait is. So each of these genes these are pleiotropic genes. Four alleles need to be considered different types of horses. So in the horse system. We have two different genes. Those two different genes um, have their own alleles. Uh, so we've got a brown coat color gene, which has a has two different alleles: the dominant B and the and the recessive B. Um, controls hair pigment. 
So a capital G, or a capital C, sorry. Capital C gives you uh, hair, pig, hair has pigment or color. And the lowercase c is no hair pigment. So these are pretty big. Uh, that's a pretty big effect on the uh, on the uh, on the appearance of the horse. If a horse carries only the no pigment gene, it does not matter what combination of alleles it has for uh, hair color. It does not have hair color. the The hair is turned off. So this gene has the potential to turn off the hair color. So that is a very strong example of epistasis, where the combination of a gene, the combination of genes on the second uh, chromosome, is usually with the effect of producing an entirely new, uh, a new phenotype. So these white horse phenotypes are the are truly only the the result of the effect of that second gene or those second set of alleles. Meanwhile, the brown and the tan horse are only, are only possible if they carry at least one color gene. So they do need to carry one of these color genes. It is a dominant gene, so they only need one. As long as they have that one color gene, then the horse will have color, and then the other, the other gene pair functions like normal. So let's, uh, let's just sort of zoom in here and see so here you have a pair of heterozygotes. Uh, that dihybrid cross is happening. Just closing a window here. So this is a, this is a normal dihybrid cross, just like we did in the previous section, uh, except that instead of instead of taking note of two different traits, like we did in the plants, which was like flower color and flower height, here we're talking about uh, the same trace, hair color. And we're going to take that. We're going to see that the horse hair color depends on the gene combination. And just like in our dihybrid cross, we're expecting that sort of nine three three one ratio. But some of those of this nine three three one are very uh, are um, are really different. So nine, you know, this is a. Uh, these are ones that carry some amount. of uh, some dominant gene for both these some amount of the dominant gene for both traits or both uh, both allele pairs so they all appear brown and then here's the other three these three carry uh, at least one dominant gene for the uh, for the second trait so they all appear tan so these are our tan horses but any horse that carries any horse that carries the recessive pair for that color that color granting trait will appear the same and that's why we end up with a very unique ratio of 9 4 3 and that's because they've they've essentially combined two of the, the sections from our normal dihybrid cross have been combined. So I don't know if any of that made any sense. But. So that's a, that's a very cool, I like this, I like talking about epistasis, especially as we, you know, the, we got to start to realize that genes are not functioning in a vacuum. They actually function together a lot of the time. And um, they can cause all sorts of wild things. So, you know, we can have things like uh, blonde hair, which is blonde hair and red hair, which are genes that would work together normally. And then if you add in a gene for baldness, you can create bald individuals, even though you have, uh, they might be carriers for red or blonde hair. So that is an epistasis trait. So consider the example to the right of total baldness gene, which can create the same baldness phenotype regardless of the hair color genes that they carry. Um, imagine if this total baldness allele is recessive to full hair and brown hair is, uh, brown hair is dominant to blonde hair, or I guess red hair in this case. 
A man born with beautiful blonde hair goes bald in his 20s, then has children with a woman with brown hair who does not have baldness in her family, but is a carrier for the blonde gene. What are the phenotypes and genotypes of the possible children? So I guess this is an example question. It's different from the one we've got here, but so let's, uh, so following this logic here, we have a man born with beautiful blonde hair and if okay wait a second let's just read this question more carefully okay brown hair is dominant to blonde hair we're using an r for some reason whoever wrote this book okay so here's our blonde hair and they go bald right so they have total baldness which is recessive and that's my baldness and we're going to cross this man with a woman with brown hair who does not have baldness, but is a carrier for blondness. So she has the, she has brown hair and blonde carrier. And they, and does not have baldness. So we're going to give him the, give her the assumption that she has no baldness, not bald. And so then we can do a dihybrid cross and bum, 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 you know, and carry through, uh, which would be a real pain to write out, but we can do it. I'm going to put the man down here because he's easy. He's recessive for both traits, whereas the woman is heterozygote. So she goes uh, first, outside, inside, last. And then we would form the crosses. Uh, this is going to be a boring set of crosses. All of their children are either going to be this type or this type. No bald children. So we only get, uh, we would get brown hair, brown hair, not bald, which is our R, R, B, B. Or we might get blonde hair, not bald. I think I made this question up because that's what I'm hoping for my own children. My wife's family has baldness running in there in it, but my family does not. <laughs> and I am blonde and my wife is brown haired. So, and apparently my children have, one has blonde hair, one has brown hair. So hopefully that, that baldness gene is recessive for them. Not that baldness is a bad thing, you know, but it's, you know, something that's still stigmatized in our society, I think, a little bit. Okay, we'll talk about additive traits tomorrow, but I'm going to end uh, the video right now. And...